elements of log design. Uh, my name is Erik Fattland, and um, this is the character I play in uh, the log community. Uh, an old fart sitting on the balcony, uh, laughing at whatever everybody else is doing. In case you're curious, the other Muppet is Al Nights and Hansen. Uh, the song over there, yes. Uh, now, we did not name these characters, somebody else did. Um, so I, I try to be a little bit, more, little bit more constructive than that guy and actually you know, sometimes uh, get up on the stage and uh, risk, um, risk ridicule for presenting ideas. Now, Elke Larsson just asked me, isn't this the same speech you give every year? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is uh, yes, but um, every year I try to organize my thoughts on art design into, um, and organize it from first principles. Uh, into some kind of accessible, uh, this is an design speech. And every year I disagree with what I said the last year. <laughs> so this will be currently my thoughts on the art design as of this particular moment in the year 2014. And tomorrow I might have a different opinion. Uh, in particular, uh, this um, lecture came from seeing, actually not the book, but the original list of articles that became the basis of the book, The Foundation Stone of Audit Clark. I was then one of the people asking, yeah, yeah, this is saying, yeah, this is a great list, but why nothing here about lot design? Uh, to which the uh, response was, well, I'm not an expert in lot design, why don't you put together a list? Yes. Yes. And I did. I looked, I picked up all the old beautiful books uh, during last summer. I read through every one of them. Uh, okay, some articles I just scanned because I said, okay, this isn't a design relevant article. Uh, I compiled a list on a napkin. And that Not list has mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Recreating it from memory, it looks like something like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, everything by A. Cutland and everything by Tools, uh, by Conspensko. That's not necessarily because everything we've written is uh, super awesome. It's just that most of the stuff we've actually written in the Tools books is about log design. J. J. Thomas Halvjain has written lots and lots of stuff on every possible subject in uh, live role playing, and there would be selected works. Uh, every single LARP report is somehow part of our discourse, because in the Nordic LARP community we've been looking at each other's LARPs and learning from them, which poses a problem that I shall come to in a moment. And pretty much everything that is in the book books is somehow related to LARP design, because uh, there is you, you cannot, as a LARP designer, not have an understanding of what LARP is, why people play it, which LARPs they have been to before, and so on, and all of this stuff is covered in the book books. So everything else, that's what making lists like this is, is, uh, makes them kind of difficult. And just to be clear, uh, I may have dreamed about that napkin. <laughs> Since I can't find it, then, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, here's a problem, though, which I noticed when trying to reread all the Knutpont uh, articles on the side. Uh, there's a lot of stuff written about the Knutpont books, and then there are a lot of conversations that are part of uh, a lot of design project. Uh, and they only overlap to some degree. That is, not everything that is being discussed by lot designers, even lot designers who are very familiar with the inter-Nordic tradition, uh, is, is ever written about. And correspondingly, uh, what is written about is not necessarily talked about. So this uh, lecture is part of trying to remedy that and part of trying to organize all of this. I'll be coming to covering three topics. What do LARP designers design? Well, LARPs obviously, but as we shall see, it is slightly more complicated than that, <laughs> without revealing any spoilers. What must we design? That is, what, what, are, what are the things that LARP designers must always try to pick up on? And what can be designed? What can we do with LARP design? Uh, and in, in case you were hoping for like a uh, talk on, of hands-on advice uh, on LARP making, uh, I've given some of those too, but this isn't that one. Uh, I like theory. I'm not, uh, I'm not a very theoretical person, but when, as far as LARP is concerned, I like to work uh, one level of, of abstraction above actual LARP practice. And the reason I think this is a fruitful approach is that uh, ever since the 90s, we realized that LARP could be so much more than what it was right now. Uh, and in the 90s, uh, our tradition consisted almost entirely of, I mean, in Norway at least, of five day long fantasy LARPs with a particular set of character, a way of writing characters, a way of creating drama. 
And so to kind of get out of the familiar, you need to lift yourself one level above that and ask, okay, so what is universal here? What can we say about rock that would also apply to those really weird art rocks they're doing in America with like the 100-page rule books? You know, what's, what's the larpiness of rock? And that's Mr. Angry Infinite Person, why I'm so theoretical. So what do LARP designers design? Yes, LARPs obviously, but LARPs are played by people. And I'll try, um, I'll try this thesis, that what we're actually designing is stuff that goes on in the players' brains. Because that's what determines everything that happens during the LARP. The player's brain is also the limit of what you can design as a LARP right? Because uh, you know, if you come up with a thousand pages of really cool content on some fictive world, you come up with a, a whole language and so on, you're limited by your player's ability to learn and to remember this stuff. Uh, case in point, uh, I was at a famous World War II lot that had something like 600 pages of compendium, which were awesome. Uh, and I memorized from there um, the joke that uh, you had the one krona uh, bill um, that was called an usling, a, a, a low person. Um, and then the two krona bill was called a quisling after our local despot, uh, which was a very World War II kind of joke. So there were, you actually needed two horrible people to make a whole whistling. Uh, so I tried to use this joke in the game, but since my co-player had not read the same page, or remembered the same page of the 600 pages, it didn't work. So the player's mind limits what we can decide. You, we can't cram it full of more information than there is space for, and they are motivated to learn. So what do they actually want? What's, what's up with, uh, what's going on in the player's brain? Because that's obviously what will um, affect the success of our LARP designs. Well, when we ask ourselves and when we ask our friends to play LARPs, they say lots of things, create a story with others, overcome my own limits, I want enough plots, I want to learn about myself. And as somebody noticed on, on, on the International Journal of Role-Playing Studies called Facebook the other day, <laughs> LARPers and the role players all over the world say this stuff even though they do radically, enormously different things. So obviously they don't actually want the same things. Also, when you talk to players after LARPs, they say stuff like, my character was unplayable, my LARP sucked because of bad design, or conversely, my LARP was really great, but that's all thanks to the organizers. Um, and sometimes, if there is behavior you think was a bit inappropriate, a bit weird, the standard excuse is, I did this because it was totally true to my character. That's totally why I decided to take my buffer sword and kill everybody in the end in the middle of LARP, because it was totally true that my character was the kind of insane psychopath that we did do this, even though we had to cancel the lock midway. <laughs> Players lie. <laughs> we lie to ourselves about why and how we roleplay. Uh, I'm convinced of this, and everything else I, do, I think about lock design uh, is influenced by that. So what's go actually going on? I've tried to make like a very simple figure uh, trying to explain what's going on when you roleplay. I mean, if you don't think this is simple, you should have seen the drafts. <laughs> they have like 30 balls or something. Uh, so basically, we're improvising. Um, and we're improvising all the time. Rock does not give us really space to plan. Uh, sometimes we can think about what we're going to do at the LARP, the upcoming LARP, and think about that for months, and then, you know, we begin playing the LARP, and some guy draws a water sword in the middle of the inn, and we have, and all those plans have to change. We take lots and lots of snap decisions every second, every minute of the LARP. This is improvisation. Now, in those very short uh, periods of time when we improvise, when we make those decisions, almost subconscious decisions, we have only a few things to help us. We have what we see about co-players, the guy drawing the water sword in the middle of the inn, uh, we have the facts we know about the universe. Uh, there are crazy people with buffer swords here. We might even know that from before the lob started. There are rules. The rule that the buffer sword is a sword, for example, but also the rule that this is a world where war is common. Helps us realize, okay, this might be a war situation, and thereby act according to that. And then there are the gut-level impulses. Fighting or fleeing. Hugging or running away. And so on. Now, if we look a bit more closely at facts, the facts we have in our mind when we improvise, uh, a lot of them are kind of deduced or connected to other facts. <coughs> so I know that uh, this is a murder mystery law. 
then I can safely assume that there will be a murder when, some, when uh, somebody in the middle of the LARP falls down with a blood stain and a, and a knife there out of the closet. We are like, aha, we expected this. Oh dear, a murder! <laughs> and we might even have consciously or subconsciously began to make plans for how to deal with the murder that will, will eventually come. Uh, there are a number of other implications from this fact. Uh, if we're true to the murder mystery genre, we should probably not reveal our knowledge uh, of, until the murderer has been caught and revealed. Um, the point of the game is actually to figure out the identity of the murderer, even if the organizers have all this rhetoric about, you know, you're supposed to immerse, and you are supposed to go with the flow of the game and be true to your character and so on. People are still going to think, well, this is a murder mystery game. <laughs> if I figure out the murderer, I will win. <laughs> and this is obviously the fun part of the game. <laughs> and there are other implications in the murder mystery genre. For example, if, if we're very familiar with Agatha Christie, then we'll tend to think that the characters should be witty and polite towards each other. So, and conversely, we don't you know, like usually draw firearms and begin shooting at each other in the middle of a murder mystery game. That's another kind of game. However, these facts could come from other sources. No, nobody might have said that this is a murder mystery game, but you get a character who is the hard-boiled detective. At which point you begin reasoning, aha, I am a hard-boiled detective. This smells of murder mystery. And then all the other implications follow. And this, in three slides, was the, uh, was the theory of interaction codes, like the trigger hair and all the facts and so on. Uh, I call those interaction codes, and I wrote a 10-page article about it in 2006 Smith book, which you don't need to read, because I just explained all the most important insights from it. <laughs> now, there's another concept which I found very useful when uh, analyzing LARP design, and it's the concept of affordances. Uh, is anyone familiar with affordances? Can we see how, yeah, a few, but not enough that can skip part of this, of this presentation, and that's good, because I really like that work. So, you are at a LARP, and you are in the forest, and you meet this guy. What do you do? <laughs> Say cheers. I need yeah. my crossbow. Yeah, exactly. We have several, several different reactions here. And in all of those reactions, I, uh, I saw an assumption. You, you only here mentioned going for his crossbow. And then he assumes that he is playing character, has a crossbow, and is good at shooting orcs with them. Now, this would be your character. Uh, the most obvious thing for your character to do is to fight the orc. But he has a tiny possibility also of fleeing the orc. Correspondingly, if uh, Jörn was not playing a, a crossbow armed warrior, uh, but instead like the, the local uh, village drunkard, then uh, fleeing might be a much more appropriate thing to do. Was anyone here imagining playing another orc? Yes, exactly. So the, your possibilities for interacting with this orc here would be uh, quite a number of things. Uh, you have a number of actions to choose from. And all of these things are affordances. They are perceivable possibilities for action. Uh, and in the original, uh, the original statement of this theory of affordances comes from a psychologist called James J. J. Gibson, who I read seven years ago, but I think I remember the key point. Uh, which is that affordances is a mechanism by which uh, all animals perceive the world around them. To the wolf that enters the forest, the forest affords hunting. The river affords drinking, and so on. That, and perceivable is, an, uh, is a key part of this. Because perception is not just seeing or sensing. Perception is what is left after our brain has done its interpretation thing with what we see and sense. So once we perceive something, we have already be begun figuring out which actions it affords. And we could use the, the uh, concept of affordances to talk about a great many things in LARP. We can de definitely use them to, um, to talk about spatial design, but we can also talk about which, uh, which actions characters afford towards it, uh, each other, um, and, uh, which, and build plots by looking at the affordances. Now, I'll combine this with another very useful concept. I mean, we are role players, right? Um, and what does this role part of role playing really mean? In the early years of Knut, we treated it as interchangeable with character, because in Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, it is. Uh, in Norwegian, we don't say character, we say rolla. And this is also kind of the original meaning of the word. An actor's part in a play, film, etc. Originally a metaphor from when, um, to prevent copyright uh, violations, 
uh, theater writers would uh, slice up their script into individual papers containing only your lines and none of the other lines. So you can just run off to the uh, printer and reprint the script. And that would be your role, containing only your character's dialogue. Uh, apparently a 17th century French word or so, that's what the English dictionary tells me. And then we have this guy here, who comes along and makes things more complicated and more magical. Uh, Jacob Levy Morino. Yeah. Uh, the man I would claim is the father or grandfather of uh, modern role playing. Uh, for no other reason than that he coined the term. I think he coined it in German, so probably Rollenspiel is the original. He lived in Vienna at the time when uh, thinking about this. And he is also the source of the term role in sociology which is uh, the simplified version is the second one there. It's a function assumed or part played by a person or thing in a particular situation. So if I, um, if I go into my office, then my role is employee. When I meet my boss, my role is that of subordinate employee. Uh, when I meet my co-workers, I'm team leader or an interaction design team, then instead my role switches to that of mentor. All of these different roles that switch between contain with them different expectations of what I am supposed to and what I am allowed to perform. If my boss speaks, I shut up and listen. Especially if my boss is finished and I super shut up and listen. Because that's the cultural constraint. Uh, if I walk into a cafe, I take on another role. Now my role is that of customer. I am permitted to sit down at any empty chair. I am uh, permitted to order coffee. Uh, I'm not permitted to jump up onto the uh, counter and perform the role of uh, rock star on stage. <laughs> if I do so, then I will encounter social sanctions. <laughs> and how do I know this? Well, I didn't figure out by jumping up onto the counter and, and trying to perform the role of rock star on stage. I've observed other people playing the customer role. The layout of the cafe itself helps tell me which roles I can play there. The fact that there is a counter that there is an area reserved for people playing the staff roles and another area reserved for people like me uh, to play the customer roles. All of this is telling me my role here is that a customer, I'm permitted to order coffee, I'm permitted to sit down, I'm expected to pay, and so on and so on. So if I might add to the work of Moreno, <laughs> I deliberately make myself small here, you see. Uh, in the context of law, I would define a role as the affordances that are socially available to a given person in a given context. So if I am out performing the hunter role that is dictated by my character, I'm a hunter, I have a crossbow, and I encounter the orc, then shooting the orc is a permissible action. The roles we use when, when role-playing uh, are often, not always, the same as the everyday roles we use uh, in other contexts, I walk into the inn at the fancy lot, I perform the customer role. And I've, I've misattributed something, my own ass, uh, not entirely. Somebody else wrote about this in, I think, 2009. Uh, but I didn't have time to look up the source when finishing my slides. <laughs> so I think that roles is a very useful concept in analyzing uh, log design talking about which roles are permitted to a given character in different circumstances and which roles do characters give to each other. The moment I give someone the character of father, I am opening up for characters of son, daughter, uh, mother, grandfather, grandmother. And finally, this is, uh, uh, there is a question. If it's a cl clarification, I'll be happy yeah. to answer it. If it's a discussion thing, we'll take so it off. Yeah. Uh, how do you use, well, how do you define character in this case? I'm tempted to refer you, refer to the Meilachti Manifesto. Uh, <laughs> what do you say, Jakob? Uh, the character is the, the, the collection of roles that you play. Hmm. Just like your, your ordinary everyday persona is a collection of roles that you perform in everyday life. Yeah. Is, that, is that the definition we're working with in your lecture? Yeah, but I'm not going to talk much about character in this lecture, so I haven't bothered to look very carefully at that. Uh, but what, what inspires me by the Mail of the Manifest is also this fictional narrative of self. Uh, that, yeah, you have a bunch of roles, but then there's also a story you tell yourself about who you are. Uh, and this together forms a character. I can see Jakob nodding, so I'm, I'm on safe ground, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs>
Okay, so uh, this is, uh, it's, it's a model that comes from, I think, ancient days in Sweden. Uh, and it has been transmitted verbally. I've never found a written source for this model. But it basically says that there are two kinds of journeys undertaken when a person goes to the LARP. One is the journey of the player, the other is the journey of the character. Now, to the left here, let's, let's see. Okay, I don't know quite, but at least the LARP is those uh, vertical lines there. You know, it has a beginning and an end. And during those, then the player and the character's journey tend to be roughly the same. Everything I do while role playing is part of the character's journey. However, a long time before the LARP, I begin making up thoughts about the character, interpreting the character, imagining the character, thinking about the character's backstory. I continue doing this while role-playing. I add facts to my character's backstory. Did you know my parents were murdered by orcs when I was a child? This was not written in my character, character backstory, but I needed something to talk about at the village inn. And for some reason, having your parents murdered by orcs seemed like a perfectly normal thing to talk about. <laughs> And, and further on, uh, my character's journey doesn't entirely end when the LARP ends. Uh, even, even if my character ends the game by dying, I continue thinking back on, okay, so what really happened there? And I continue forming this narrative of what happened to the character. I have some hidden slides here, if we have time. Uh, it's the slides on the infamous N-word, um, the narrative. <laughs> where, where we might talk about more about this. Uh, and um, I think I got the concept of parallel from Johanna Collinan's brain, uh, which popped up at, at the LARP Writer Winter Retreat. Is this correct, Jok? Probably. Yeah. Is a word. Yeah. I didn't make that up. Yeah, okay, but then we transported it to LARP, and I found that very useful. Because you have like a text, you have a book, you have um, this year's beautiful book, for example, and it has lots of, uh, lots of articles and so on. But it also has a cover, it has a back cover, it has an index, uh, it has page numbers and all this stuff, and that, if I understand it correctly, forms the paratext. Uh, so it's not really officially considered part of the text, but it's still kind of part of the text. And once we look at this in LARP, kind of what here is beyond the LARP, but still kind of integral to it, it becomes a pretty big thing. Uh, before a lot, I sign on, I attend pre-briefs, I meet my group, I attend maybe workshops, I read materials, and so on. And also after a lot, there might be debriefs, parties, reviews are written, and all this defining the narrative of what this lot was all about. And let's call all of this the parallel. And as lot designers, unless we work in a tradition where we do a whole lot of runtime game games mastering, most of our tools are actually concentrated on the parallel. So if you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, in the case of LARP, you actually should. Because all the stuff that happens before the LARP is where the LARP uh, design is expressed. <coughs> I'll move on to my second topic here. What must be designed? I have a proposal that there are two things we always must think about when designing LARPs. Two things that do not immediately follow from the idea of LARP itself but that are universal to whatever kind of LARP you're running, wherever you're running it. The first is alibi to play. And the term alibi, uh, I'm not quite sure where it entered the Nordic conversation on LARP, but there is no like the definite book or the definite article on alibi, but it still is a very useful term. So if you murder someone, but then you have an alibi, you're hiding out some, you were uh, sitting somewhere else together with a bunch of people, then you cannot be excused of murdering someone. And if you uh, are an adult and you want to play, uh, and play is not always socially permissible for adults to do, you need some kind of excuse that permits you to play. I've, I can illustrate this. I've tried to introduce live role playing in my workplace, uh, mostly not to experiment with LARP, but mostly because it's useful for service design, uh, which is part of my job. So I want my colleagues to also be part of role playing so that we could role play further in various projects. Uh, knowing Norwegian culture, uh, I solved this by distributing, uh, making sure alcohol was distributed before we started. And uh, my experience was just how well this works. Because there was not enough alcohol in the room. Three of the four groups I divided my colleagues into caught on to the role playing very quickly. The fourth group, the ones that had come too late to the bear case, did not. <laughs> So there are many different ways we can give people alibi. One of them is by simply being authoritarian, by our 
uh, authoritative. By being the person who controls the room, I am your social drama instructor. <laughs> now, I, um, based on the authority delegated to me by the people who hired me to guide you in social drama, I tell you to play the boss. <laughs> and so everybody knows he's not going to run to be bossy because he wants to be bossy. He's doing a job I asked him to do. The second thing I think we always need to think about, but that does not follow naturally from the idea of LARP, is that we need a language to interact with. Uh, language I now use metaphorically in the broadest possible sense. Uh, how many here saw my Nordic LARP talk on Thursday? Okay, not enough. I shall repeat one example then. Let us say that I have been given the character of a merchant from the city of Libidibi. And we meet. And I greet you in this way. Now, what did that mean? Well, if you haven't been familiar with the culture of the merchants of Libidibi, you would realize that I combined two gestures, one of which insulted your mother's grave and the other which complemented the color of your eyes. However, for this to be meaningful for as a law of interaction, you need to know this. You need to know what this gesture means. If we are role-playing uh, the board of an advertising com company, uh, we need to have a common idea of what it means to be in the board of an advertising company, what it means when the boss says, shut up, or with the kind of culture where that is uh, a definite, uh, somebody has transgressed, or is it the normal thing in this company, and so on. So we always need to have a shared understanding of some common ways of communicating in the fiction. And then to my favorite part, what can be designed. <coughs> now, as long as I've been doing log design, there has been an insult uh, used about log people don't like, and it is railroading. Uh, it's when you're uh, not free to pursue uh, the uh, actions that are natural to your character, or that you as a player want to introduce into the game. But it's then the organizers come in, and they force you to go in this direction. And you try going in that direction, but the organizers push you in this direction again. And I've often been accused of railroading. I think it's gotten better with years. But manipulation, for some reason, seems to be good. And manipulation means that uh, when somebody makes you do something, thinking it was your own idea all along. <laughs> and to some degree, we expect that of lock rights. Because we want the freedom to do whatever we, we feel is natural for ourselves. But we also want this to somehow cohere, to somehow fit, it together, fit together, and even better, if it surprises us with what it made us feel or made us do during the lob. <coughs> so this is actually manipulation, but we want it, and therefore manipulation in lob design is a good thing. And for lob designers, that means we need to be kind of sneaky. And I'm now going to talk about different ways that we can be sneaky. So how do you manipulate players into improvising the experience you want them to have? This is slightly over the genre of uh, hands-on advice. I uh, assembled this for the Law Exchange Exam Academy last year. First of all, we can tell them what to do. At 12 o'clock, uh, you should make sure the murder happens. Uh, you should go uh, off to where Lady Winthrop is uh, applying her makeup, take a dagger, stab her, and hide her in the closet. When applied with care, this can work then you have started the murder mystery. Or you can tell them what it is about and then let them figure out how to do it. Well, the theme of this party is a murder. We haven't actually planned the murder, so you guys figure it out. And, you know, they usually manage to do that. It's very strange. When you tell people they're allowed to murder someone, they... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can use an interaction code, those were the three slides I mentioned earlier. You can give them a reference, uh, either a genre, this is a murder mystery, this is a science fiction rock set in, uh, in an aggressive military organization. Uh, this is a schoolyard, very much like the schoolyards you grew up in. Uh, and these uh, key facts uh, invite a number of further implications and so on that in turn direct role playing. You can pit them against each other. I think at Knut Punkt 1997, the very first one, there was a lecture on plot theory that was never written down. But it basically begins with, so you have 10 soldiers. Lots of fun? No. What happens if we make five of them into orcs? <laughs> <laughs> and then we go from there. 
Internal conflict, this is more of a character writing tool. You make it interesting to figure out what to do. Should I go that way or should I go that way? Uh, should I follow my heart or should I please my, my family? Uh, duty or desire? Or should we as a group, should we ally with those guys or with those guys? Eternal conflicts. Challenge. <coughs> you guys want X. And then you make it difficult to get X. You want money, but there is only a limited supply of money in this game. Uh, and there are many other people who are trying to trade stuff uh, to, to, uh, to get it. Uh, it's actually the design of Hog Street, if I'm not mistaken. Or, you want to be the king. Oh, there can only be one king, and there are five people who want to be the king. Now we have challenge. Controlling the external world. You use your GM power over the rest of the universe to nudge players into behaving. Uh, so, uh, hello, I would, like to, uh, I would like to talk to my army, please. Uh, yes, Mr. General. I'm sorry, your army is off duty and are currently having a nap. You can't talk to them. Goodbye. Okay, now we can strain the players. <laughs> or, yes, sir, we will be there with a hundred people at once. Uh, Co games masters, can you call every, all your friends? We need an army to, because this <laughs> game is going out of hand. <laughs> Framing, you slice up the time and space of the LARP. This was a, a very hypothetical thing to do ten years ago, and now it's perfectly ordinary. Uh, day one of the LARP is the year 1982, day two is the year 1983, and day uh, three is the year 1984. This was the, the structure of just a little lovin', uh, which allowed the story to cohere in a very different way than if all three days had been during the same year. You could even go further, uh, which I think there are examples of, where you say that, okay, in this room of the LARP, the year is 2014, uh, and we are successful business people. Uh, in this room, once you cross this line here, we are the same characters, but the year is 1967, and we are radical hippies go back and forth and, uh, and uh, continue just talking to your friends about whatever your character is concerned about at about this particular point of time. Mechanics and techniques. I'm glad I didn't write meta-technique because uh, if I had said meta-technique with this definition that is not the current consensus definition, I think this room might have er erupt in violence. <laughs> But if we, in certain situations, do stuff that affects the player and the character differently, monologue, for example, uh, if I'm allowed to speak the inner thoughts of, of uh, my character, this will influence the game in a very different way. That was very consciously used by the um, by the original law. Um. Brain, hello. <laughs> uh, new voices in art. Yes. New Voices in Art is about a gallery where people are exhibiting stuff. And they are art students and they are very keen to sell their art and become famous. But the LARP isn't really about that. So uh, you have the monologue technique where you fling the glass and you're, uh, you begin expressing the thoughts of your character. And this whole technique was uh, designed to make the LARP go according to the theme envisioned by the designers, which was to figure out kind of what it means to be a young person uh, trying to fit out in an adult professional world. Hierarchy, this is a classic tool of, in the Lock Right Toolbox. Give some characters plenty of power over others and set up some rules that make the interaction of power and non-power interesting. Now, how do we make the interaction of power and non-power interesting? Uh, there are at least two different approaches. One is to strengthen power. So, uh, as a person without power, you're only allowed to play inside the playground set by the powerful. This limits your options, but makes the affordances very, very clear. Uh, the other is to allow for the challenge of power, to allow for the revolution or to allow for the little jokes that make the officer so uncomfortable that eventually he will give up being the officer. Status. High status, low status, does the term, I think the term we use it in a lot is roughly, uh, comes from Keith Johnston in Impro Theatre, uh, where he talks about status as who is dominant in a given situation and who is submissive. But the key point of uh, the way I read Johnston is that status becomes interesting when it becomes dynamic. When you have the master and the servant, uh, and the servant is actually the guy who in a very submissive manner is telling the master what to do. And the master keeps trying to reassert his authority. Fictional values. Tell them which values they have. You ask them to pretend to have values and beliefs that lead to certain behaviors. Uh, I believe that half of the world are actually evil spirits that are out to get me. 
uh, this will deter great themes and conflicts because I think your evil spirit is out to get me. Um, and so I'm afraid and then this will affect the game further. Rituals. <laughs> I'm Norwegian, I, I have to love rituals. And puzzles, finding clues in, around the game, asking their place, repeating, finding them. And this, I think, was the law of design tradition I know very well from the 1990s, where usually there were like five pieces of the great Elven amulet that were hidden around the area, and some people knew where they were, and, but no, nobody knew everything, and then there were three different groups, and one of them might be even wanting the world to end, and two other groups. Does this, not, does this sound familiar? Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> Classic law of design. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I've tried to bring all this together, and this slide, I can see you taking pictures of it, and that's okay, and this is being filmed, and it's okay. But I don't want to see uh, this reference in the blog post and so on because it's not finished. Please, it's not finished. I will continue working with it even while putting together this, this lecture I discovered. No, 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 that makes sense. I have to fix that. There's nothing here about body language, and I think that's so important. It needs to be here. But this is basically trying to end, uh, answer the question what can we design? How can we affect the game? Summarizing all the uh, common techniques I listed in the pre two previous ones uh, into one single map of the domain of log design. At the top here we have the vision, not essential, but many LARPs work by the organizer articulating relating what we want, and then letting every, everything else follow from that. The two enablers, the essential things that we should think about but don't automatically do so, the interaction language that we share uh, a language to play, and the alibi to play. Then we come into what is what you, the stuff that usually goes into a LARP script, the concepts, schedule, space, aesthetics, mechanics, which I group together under a frame. Uh, what we know about the world, the situation of the genre, what we know about the society, how it's organized, hierarchy and so on, the relationships between people in it, and the culture uh, that the people have, the values and so on, inherent in that. Uh, and finally, the individuals, the roles available to them, the identities or stories they tell about themselves, their ambitions, um, and so on. Then we have the parallel, which is all the stuff where this is actually expressed, how people are taught to, uh, to understand the concepts of the law. Um, and finally, that leads to the dark. Now, I'll try, uh, I'll try a bold statement here, and it is to say that every LARP has all of the stuff above here. Every LARP, every LARP designer has a vision, even if they don't articulate it. Uh, every LARP uh, happens in the world, even uh, luminescence, where people are just only know that they're cancer of patients and playing in a world of flower they are still making images of which kind of world the characters live in. So no matter whether we design them or not, these things are present. The exception here is runtime. Runtime is an option. LARP rights can and have uh, hidden away after the game stops and left the, the runtime entirely to the players. Just to illustrate uh, how this actually works in practice, I'll take a case of the simplest LARPs ever designed, I think. This is the whole LARP script. This is everything that is known about 13 at the table, except for two things. The two additional things is the information that the organizers will make at dinner, and that the LARP has a certain location and duration. Uh, and as we can see, this is, a, this is a family tree. So what usually happens when people say, we're going to play 13 at the table, is you get it somewhere. There will be a dinner. Uh, people cast themselves into these different characters. Uh, and then for four hours, typically, they um, role play this average -ish Norwegian family. And there's a whole lot of improvisation. It usually turns into a blend of comedy uh, and uh, during the first two or three hours of the lock, where people keep improvising new stuff. Uh, very theater like and then usually towards the end of a 13 at the table run things get more serious people begin having a grip on who their character is and they begin feeling some strong issues relationships with the other characters but at the beginning right before the lock you know where they get into the family tree now those pieces of information define only a few things in this map uh, they find the roles available for people because you can read some roles out of the family tree you can read that who is a father who is a mother daughter, son, grandfather, grandmother. You can also read cousins, brothers and sisters. So suddenly there are a bunch of social roles available for these characters. And we know something about which, which affordances those roles have towards each other. Uh, the relationships are kind of implied, but not very strong. Uh, the relationships basically follow from the roles there. 
Uh, there is a schedule, there's a beginning and an end, and there is a dinner. We know this before we begin playing. Uh, collaboration. The lab designers have allowed you to collaborate on almost everything in Thirteen at the Table, and we know this because nothing else is described. And the scenography usually just follows from the fact that you are in somebody's home. Now the thing is that when adding these facts together, we get a situation. It's a family dinner. This is not explicit in the, uh, in the script of Thirteen at the Table. But it's a family dinner. We also know that these characters are bo uh, were born at uh, particular times, which dictates that this law is probably now. We are people having a fam an ordinary Norwegian family having a family dinner today. Not stated explicitly, but it's the shared information we'll begin acting on. And from that situation, we get pretty much everything else. Uh, from that situation and improvisation, we get an idea of how to use, use the room, how to dress, uh, how to role play with others. We get an idea of what is the genre of this thing. Uh, the improvisation leads to comedy, and after a while it naturally moves towards, now, to, towards social realism. Um, and everything we don't, we still don't know, we just deduce from the world around us today. I think, just one thing. Yeah. To add to next time I'll tell about this. It's the name, 13 at the table. Mm. It means a lot for me. Yeah. I play this and it, it doesn't say comedy for me. It says it's going to be conflict. It's going to be something difficult because it's certain at the table. Uh, true, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Just take another case. Now I'm, I'm simplifying a lot because now I saw we looked at how a few facts are 13 on the table to get a constructed LARP. If we looked at only at the final stage, what are the big things that influence all the other boxes? Melon Himmel or Kahn, famous LARP 2004, I think? Three. Three? Three. Yeah. Uh, defines new gender roles and has a series of workshops in advance facilitating how to role play romance between these gender roles. And a whole lot of the law follows out from these things, these elements. Uh, Kippy Genesis, I could have taken many other laws as an example, but uh, 1984 law, um, uh, there is a strict hierarchy. There are three levels. You can either be in a party, out of party, or a proletarian. We call them something else in the game. And if you're uh, out of party or proletarian, you always greet the highest rank by doing this, borrowed from the wave. And pretty much all of role playing at that lot followed from a few th simple things that define organization. We wrote lots of characters, but I don't know how much they actually matter to people's lot experience. Uh, Karpu uses the big workshop in advance to define the lot, and I think a lot of the Danish, uh, new Danish school LARPs uh, are very based on this facilitation as a way of creating the lot. Uh, and so, I think my point is that when we go attack LARP designers, LARP rights, it's tempting to begin filling out every box in here. But that's not actually how LARP design ends up working because the player's brain is limited. Uh, the players can only fit so much information. We tend to simplify by focusing on a few things, which I shall call keystone elements that influence a whole lot of the rest of the law. And now it was exactly quarter two, uh, so I think it will end here and open for questions and discussions. Or you can leave it, it's okay. It's <laughs>
Yeah. I think this is uh, the question was is there also a flow upwards? Like does uh, your design work on the parallel influence division, for example? Yeah. And I think yes, definitely. In, in terms of the design process, uh, how you work with a lot of design, I think that's very often the way it is. Uh, that it's all like a kind of a bundle of ideas that you keep like working through, untangling and organizing. And it looks like this only kind of the moment the lot is about to begin. Uh, I think Emma and then uh, Jonas and Ella. Okay, how do you... Okay, one, one view I have of our, so to speak, progression mm. is that we have developed a toolkit for players to use, like these meta techniques and, and whatnot. Mm. And what's emerging now is very much more uh, also a toolkit for LARP rights, like mm. what the LARP factory doing, or Peter Munkoff's blog on, mm. on methods and so on. Uh, and in a way, I see that as almost like macros that you can just point players at and, and say, we're doing this, and then it doesn't have to take up new space in their brain. Mm. Do, you, do you see that this could maybe be like an outline for the blanks we need to fill in in this new toolkit for, for log script making? Yeah, quite possibly. I think in a way that's, that's why I'm trying to work with this kind of mapping to see, uh, okay, where can we still make progress? How what what hasn't been explored? How would you prefer that we do that? How do we build this database? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should continue with Jonas and then Ella, yep. and then Morgan. Uh, your final point on keystone elements. Yeah. Uh, was it a recommendation for organizers or for designers to define their keystone elements in advance? Because to me, it it usually comes out a bit random. You mm. introduce four things and one of them becomes immensely important and sort of shapes the rest of the game. Do you think it's possible to, for instance, this type of organization to, to, to pin it out in advance? Yeah, I actually think so. Uh, I, this is where I, I leave kind of the, the realm of rational discourse and they just begin talking about purely personal experiences. That the more successful of the science I've been involved in, we have had a pretty good idea of what were our key keystone elements uh, without having that term. And the less successful ones, we've been a little bit all over the board. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I've actually, maybe answering a little bit of Emma's question, I think what I want to turn this into, once it's more or less stable, is a canvas. That is a very big poster you can put on the wall in a design group, and you can begin writing up, okay, what have we defined here? What are, what are the elements here? And which ones are kind of being covered by some other elements? Uh, and I think Ella and another. We talk about vision, but mm. in a lot of cases we build games with specific intents with goals. Yeah. I don't think a goal and a vision are the same thing. I think you need both. Well, the goal may be optional, but it is distinct from the vision, and it's especially true in political games. Yeah. Uh, can you give me, me an example of goal? Uh, I want to teach people about new gender roles. Right. So you may have an aesthetic vision, and you also have a political goal. Yeah. And that's going to drive a lot of the different do because you have a set of outcomes that you want. Mm. Yeah, a good point. It's not really covered here. Uh, but I think, uh, as you say, goals are uh, optional in a way. Yeah. But even if we don't ever have talk about visions, articulate visions, there is still a vision. Yeah, yeah I think it's because it influences a lot of the other stuff. I think it's yeah. useful to say, okay, you might have one of these if you do, yeah. then we can talk about how it flows down. Because mm. it'll make us better at, at making those kinds of games. Yeah. That was Morgan, followed by Shoshana, and I think that would be the last speaker. I have a little bit of a question. Uh, where you, how you, with this, uh, think about uh, the work you wrote about in, in, your, in your piece on uh, uh, the, not the interaction codes, the other one. Incentives. Yeah, in, yeah. Uh, incentives and the, uh, Okay, Morgan is referring to an article I, I published in 2005, I think, oh, yeah. which basically goes through uh, actually a lot of the most common techniques at the time for writing, for designing LARPs, or most common methods used in LARP design. And a lot of, lot of that was puzzles and triggers and puzzle structures uh, and also fates and instruction structures uh, and so on. I think it is here, but it is below the surface in this map. 
And that's, that also reflects how my understanding of LARP design has changed since uh, well, the late 90s. Well, I'm thinking about the fog of LARP and the, and the attractors yeah. that you don't kind of seem to have as written out, at least in this. Mm. Is that something you've left behind then, or is it? No, I still think those are useful concepts, but I don't think they're useful concepts as kind of to draw up and put on the wall and like, have we thought about the fog of LARP or yep. what are our attractors here? Mm. I think, I mean, th this is stuff I partly borrowed from Marcos Montolas metaphorical adoption of, of the of chaos uh, chaos model of organizations to LARP, which is printed in the 2003 book book, uh, which I think it's, it's very good for widening your mind. Uh, and I think as a LARP writer, you should re read these more hard theory articles and also think carefully about what does this mean in LARP. But once you have widened your mind, you don't need to return to it for every LARP. Well, how, here I'm trying to actually find something that is useful in every case. And then, for sure. Yeah, uh, campaigns I think are an interesting case because as a Nordic uh, uh, guy, I tend to think in one shots. Uh, but the way campaigns fit into this is in the whole like, how do you deal with space and time in the law? I mean, I've noticed American law when they say a lot, they're often talking about kind of a recurring event in their local scene uh, with a set of, of regular ish players and regular -ish mechanics. And in a way, that is actually the same thing as we talk about a lot in Nordic countries. It's just a lot that's played once per month over a very long period of time. So you could still say that the same stuff applies to the law design as a whole, uh, and then you might want to readjust or relook at it, or take a new look at it for each episode. Hmm. Okay, I, I said uh, last speaker now. So yeah, and it's five minutes till the next event. So I think we'll end here. Thank you very much.